Before I introduce today's guest, I want to tell you about our sponsor of our podcast, uh, The Great Courses Plus. This is the teaching company, The Great Courses, which I've been listening to for decades. They have thousands of uh, professionally produced college courses or courses taught by college professors, the best in the country. And they, they've introduced an uh, app for your phone. It's thegreatcoursesplus.com. And uh, so you just t- touch the app and you open up the course you want to listen to. The one I just started this week is on uh, Understanding the Old Testament by Professor Robert D. Miller II. So um, just to give you an idea uh, of how it works, you just touch on the lecture you want to listen to. Like number one is the Old Testament is literature. Number two is the Genesis creation story. I'm right now on uh, chapter th- or lecture three, what God intended for Adam and Eve. Oh boy, this should be interesting. In any case, this is great because you can skip around. If I find one of the lectures boring, I just skip to the next one. Uh, you can do it on audio or video and all from your phone. It's, it's a terrific way to consume content, particularly during social isolation. During the pandemic, it's a great way to become an autodidact. So if you want to know more, you can, if you sign up through uh, my podcast, uh, then you get um, a free trial. So go to uh, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash salon. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash salon, and you get a free trial with uh, free access to the entire library of all these hundreds and hundreds of courses and thousands of lectures. So with that, I'll introduce my next guest. My guest today is Michael Schellenberger. You've probably seen him in the news. He's been getting a lot of media attention for his new book, Apocalypse Never, Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All. And the iconic picture of the polar bears, which, uh, as probably most of you know now, have made uh, quite the comeback. In fact, their biggest cause of death appears to be hunting, but that's we don't don't get into that subject. Anyway, Michael Schellenberger Schellenberger is Time Magazine's Hero of the Environment, uh, and the winner of the 2008 Green Book Award from the Stevens Institute of Technology's Center for Science Writing, and an invited expert reviewer of the next assessment report for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Very prestigious. He's written on energy and the environment for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Nature Energy, and other publications for the past two decades. He is founder and president of Environmental Progress, an independent, nonpartisan research organization based in Berkeley, California. At the end, we talk a little bit about that and what you can do to uh, join and support uh, what he's calling environmental progress. Anyway, we talk about the necessity, uh, quite a few things, including the necessity of having environmental activism bona fides like he does, because this is such a politically charged and polarized issue. Um, environmentalism as a faux religion. He puts forward this interesting hypothesis that uh, I rather enjoyed. He's he's promoting environmental humanism as kind of a replacement worldview for environmental activism as a kind of religion. Uh, we agree from the beginning, global warming is real and human caused. And from there, we talk about the models and why the error bars get so wide the further out you project. The consequences of global warming, what we should do about it. Uh, and then we hit number of specific points. For example, the Amazon is the Earth's lungs with all those fires burning the Earth's lungs. What was the myths about that? Plastic straws recycling, uh, the sixth extinction extinction um, that we're apparently no longer in, which is good. Well, we were never in. Uh, how sweatshops save the planet, another counterintuitive idea. How technology and capitalism save the whales, We talk about meat eating, nuclear energy. Actually, the main focus here is why renewables like solar and wind can never match nuclear and why the fears of nuclear power are overblown. Uh, We talk about fracking, Temple Grandin, um, the whole idea of what's natural is good and what's non-natural is bad and the problem with that kind of philosophy behind a lot of the environmental movement has been environmentalism is Calvinism. Talk about Greta Thunberg and uh, environmental activists that are are pretty active out there uh, in protesting and uh, and what's the real way to make progress in environmentalism. Like, it feels like I've been reading you for decades. It's awesome to be able to talk with you. Oh, <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, as you know, I've touched on this subject 
a number of times. And whenever I do, uh, you know, it kind of brings out the most extremes in, in people and their responses. Either I'm a climate denier or I'm a sympathizer to um, fossil fuels or, or, or whatever. It seems right. like we're almost... This seems like a, a perfect example of the kind of binary thinking that we're prone to slide into, just black and white. So, in this case, yeah. you're either you're either a believer that global warming is real, human caused, and apocalyptic, catastrophic, existential doomsday scenarios that follow, or else you're a climate denier. Right. So, you know, I'm not one of those. Obviously, you're not either. And I guess we're called lukewarmers now, as the latest. <laughs> the expression. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, but I loved your book. Just let me introduce it again. I, I will have already introduced you um, before we started recording here. Apocalypse Never, Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All. And of course, you chose the polar bear as the iconic symbol on the cover because apparently that's no longer used uh, as kind of a symbol of climate change, right? That's kind of dropped off the radar. Well, no. I mean, the New York Times, you know, the New York Times has refused to re re review my book. It refused to publish an op-ed by me, um, you know, uh, and then but they've done two articles. And I'm not saying it's in response to me necessarily. But over the last two days, they've done two articles, one of which said, no, no, polar bears are actually going to go extinct. We know this. And then the other one that was yesterday. And then today's was was, oh, well, you know, temperatures even below five degrees are very high. And because one of the points I make in the book is that it's unlikely that we're going to go above three degrees above pre-industrial levels. You know, no amount of warming is ideal, but three degrees is a lot better than five degrees. So I feel yeah. like I told myself, yeah. I was like, I feel like I'm being subtweeted by the New York Times. <laughs> <in their articles."> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I missed that because I, I guess the whole environmental thing has kind of been knocked off the front pages, mainly uh, you know, it was big last year in 2019 was kind of the, the year of uh, Me Too and, and, and Greta Thunberg and environmentalism. And now it's right. all gotten bumped off by Black Lives Matter and, and COVID. Yep. Um, so your your book is coming out as, as kind of an opportune time to remind people that, you know, this issue hasn't gone away. <laughs> right. Uh, whatever the issue is, however you want to define it. Right. Um, it's, uh, I've seen quite a bit of media. I don't know about the New York Times, but I've seen you uh, around quite a bit on, on, on media coverage and interviews. And of course, you're always introduced as, you know, a, a one time hardcore environmental activist, which you describe in detail in your book. Uh, but the fact that that people need to say that, in fact, I feel the need to say it, too, you know, that, you know, I'm not talking to, you know, a, a researcher for Sean Hannity on Fox News. Uh, right. You're not some uh, right wing nut job uh, pulling out numbers out of his hat. Right. You 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 had the the, the real life of an environmental activist. I am an environmental activist. I still am. I'm still a climate activist, too. Um, and I, I think I'm kind of hardcore. Uh, <laughs> you know, the book was not an easy book to write. It, it required mm. a lot of from me, required more than anything I've ever done. And and, you know, every time I've changed, I've, I've had three moments where I've changed my mind about big things as they relate to the environment. Um, and each of them, I've lost friends and funders, donors, and that's happened again. So it's not it's not something that you do that I've done that I do lightly. Um, so but yeah, I mean, my day job, you know, is I'm an environmental activist. I, uh, yeah, I used to advocate for renewables. Now I uh, believe nuclear energy is very important. Um, but yeah, I mean, I consider myself a, a climate activist and not only that, but I, I take pride in having prevented emissions from rising more, uh, from rising. I think I've reduced or prevented emissions from rising more than any other climate activist in the United States because we've prevented so many nuclear plants from closing down. So it's definitely an identity I still have. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the whole subject has become so politically polarized I'm not sure when that started, but you you could put a uh, a pin on it at uh, Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, which kind of associated environmentalism with the you know left wing liberal democratic arm of uh, of politics, and therefore if you're anywhere to the right, you have to oppose it or object it or 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 whatever, just as kind of a signal to your fellow group members that you know you're a skeptic of climate because you're a good Republican or or something like that. That's unfortunate <laughs> because, you know, it contaminates the data one way or the other. And it always means you got to check, double check the source and where the numbers came from and, and so on, which is why I like you 
uh, rely on the IPCC because I know my liberal friends are going to go, oh, IPCC, oh, in that case, then the numbers are, are reliable. Um, so it's funny that we even have to think of it like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what's happening right now in response to my book is there's a lot of environmental journalists, people whose job it is to cover climate change and activists who and frankly, a lot of scientists, too, who are just surprised by the facts in Apocalypse Never. A lot of them just don't believe it. Um, hmm. so I've seen some react. Oh, no, I'm sure we're in a sixth mass extinction. Nope. And neither of the two major scientific advisory, the two major international scientific groups say that. In fact, the head of it told me we're not for sure. Another one is this idea that climate change is making natural disasters worse. Natural disasters are getting better. Fewer people are dying in natural disasters. So how could they be getting worse? Oh, well, they say worse than it might otherwise have been. Hmm. Well, okay, wait a second now. You've just switched to a hypothesis. Hypotheses, as you know, as a as a scholar of science, you know hypotheses are very important. That's not the same thing as scientific evidence. You know, if I say, um, you know, uh, I mean, I was joking because I kind of was like, if I say aliens are not invading Earth, somebody could say, well, you don't really know that. I mean, look, we've had Navy pilots now with these really close uh, <laughs> encounters. Um, you have thousands of people that say they've seen aliens. So it could be that aliens are invading Earth. Well, sure. And you can't prove a negative, right? That's the whole thing. You can't prove the non-existence no. of God. Yeah. It's something that you've written on. I think you've written on this. I think I've read you on this. Um, yeah. But if you're the president of the United States and school children are worried they're going to be killed by aliens – you don't go up there and say, we can't say for sure that aliens aren't invading Earth. You get up here and say, aliens are not invading Earth. Like, so there's just right. simple things like that right. where I think, people don't, you know, I think most people don't. I think most climate activists don't know that deaths from natural disasters have declined 90 percent. I think if you go on the street and you ask people, are deaths from natural disasters going up because of climate change? I think they say yes. In Berkeley, yeah. I'm in Berkeley one of the most educated <laughs> cities in the world. I think that my neighbors would all say that. I'm, I'm sure they would. So I think there's some shock by people. And it's kind of like, does IPCC say that? Well, yes, but it's at, the certain, at a certain point, it's just, da it's just data. It's not like IPCC is right. different right. data or something. And those facts alone, that I think the deaths are declining from natural disasters and that carbon emissions have peaked in rich countries and have been going down for between 15 to 40 years in most rich countries – I don't think people know that. So there's just some basic things I think that people are like reacting to that they're just kind of they're learning for the first time. And now we're seeing a little bit of a scramble by The Times and others um, to kind of go, no, no, these things are still a big problem, but they're not actually willing to even provide the context for how to think about those problems. When did you uh, discover that these things were not true? And, and what was the effect of your your thinking and activism on those revised facts? I mean, I really – so the book – one of the characters in the book is somebody named Roger Pelkey, and he is mm -hmm. one of the world's experts on whether or not climate change is making disasters worse. So he reached out to me in 2005 after I co-authored The Death of Environmentalism, which was this controversial essay 15 years ago, and was like, oh, we've been saying something similar. We became friendly. We're about the same age. He lives in Colorado. Mm -hmm. I'm from Colorado. We see each other. Really nice guy. Really good guy. And I describe how he's been completely smeared by um, various climate activists and activist scientists. But he explained – it took me a while to understand what he was saying. Um, and so in 2008 or 2009, I think I finally got it. And then hmm. I sort of felt bad. I was like, oh, God, I shouldn't be saying these things. I then authored a bunch of essays, co-authored a bunch of essays, including with him – and others that basically said this similar stuff about climate change, but we did it in this very academic way and it was ignored. And then I was, I finally was like, look, it's just so crazy. Climate, the discussion about climate change is so crazy. I'm just going to focus on something important that I can do. And that was nuclear energy. And so I decided to focus on nuclear energy, you know, really over the last 10 years um, and then heavily over the last five and I had a book on nuclear. I actually wrote the whole book. And and mm. at the same time, my my, you know, at the same time, Greta Thunberg was in, literally encouraging children to panic. Mm -hmm. And the word panic means unthinking behavior. And this was happening at the same time. She's encouraging people to panic at the same time that Extinction Rebellion was engaging in some very dangerous protests in London. 
And at that point, I was like, forget about it. I'm just going to do I just got to take down the alarmism. And it all ended up fitting together. There's still a lot of nuclear in the book, as you know, but like the nuclear alarmism predated climate alarmism. And yeah. in fact, overpopulation yeah. alarmism and, and nuclear alarmism kind of overlapped in time. But then as it became clear that the, the the rate of population growth had peaked and declined in the 1980s, which was also the same period of time that the Cold War ended, that was when apocalyptic people, apocalyptic environmentalists, shifted their focus from nuclear and overpopulation to climate change. Yeah, that was an interesting part of your book, uh, kind of speculative in a way toward the end about uh, how it's become a religion and why. The why part is harder to prove or test. Maybe in the fullness of time, we'll have a better idea of that. But that shift from uh, sort of taking the bigger picture that, uh, you know, the, the rise of secularism, the decline of mainstream religions, the rise of the new age, and then by the 80s, you have people searching for causes. And here I, I, I turn to where you started your book with, with the Extinction Rebellion protests in London, and now we're watching, you know, BLM protests and so on. Uh, it, it makes me think that we have an impulse to moralize. We're not just moral primates. We have a moral impulse, but also to moralize uh, about what other people should be doing or causes that we want to take up. And you just see the passion in these people, leaving aside the, you know, the kind of extreme right wing skinheads or, or left wing Antifa people, just, you know, genuine people that want to make a difference. They want to get out there and do something. And, and, and that seems to be a really powerful motive. And the point, one point of your book is that but if you're basing your moralization on false facts, what are you doing? You're actually harming people. And so, so pick it, pick it up there with the uh, Extinction Rebellion. Why you started with them, and and, and where wow. you think that kind of protesting can take us. Well, so the first thing to point out, so I think you're you're right. There's, I wouldn't say it's speculative, but certainly towards the end of the book, when you get into questions of why are we treating manageable environmental problems as apocalyptic problems. In other words, here's climate change. You know, um, we're going to have to adapt to it to some extent. You know, we're going to also move towards cleaner fuels. But either way, it's not like the climate god is going to come down and punish us. You know, (laughs) the difference is between the big difference of how we survive things like floods or hurricanes is whether we live in a developed society or not. So I spent a lot of time in this book talking about the difference between my house and the house of Bernadette, a woman in the Congo. Mm. I have a flood control system. When it rains, the water is diverted around my house. When it rains in the Congo, their house is flooded because they have no flood control system. So how did we not see that? Well, to some extent, it's because we're rich and we don't see it. But in rich countries, the people who are apocalyptic, first about overpopulation and nuclear power, and now about climate change, it's not randomly distributed. It's a mm. particular group of people. Who are those people? Well, we all know who they are. I mean, they're they tend to be more politically to the left. And and this is where there is good research, actually. And it's cross national research. They tend to be more secular. They tend to not mm-hmm. believe in God. They tend to not believe. Now, I think there's a number of secular people, maybe yourself, uh, Steven Pinker, others who I sort of am talking to. You might say rationalists, probably atheists, but they don't embrace this kind of woo apocalyptic yeah. religion. So I, I'm not d- d- discounting that, but it is notable in the research that secular people gravitate towards it. The other thing I discovered is that is that they repeat Judeo-Christian myths of Genesis and the Garden of Eden and of all of nature being a, yeah. Whole, yeah, like yeah. a puzzle. And then they have Book of Revelations, which is the apocalyptic, the final apocalyptic chapter of the Bible. But they don't know that they're repeating Bible stories right. because they never they never actually went to Bible school. You know, so so it's it's like they they and it's in the culture. You know, if you watch superhero movies, we're all going to save the world. So you're right when you say it's morality in the sense that once you realize if you or I should say once you believe that whatever bad things you do in this life are not going to be punished in the afterlife. In other words, there's if you believe there's no God that will punish you after you die, why yeah. can not do bad things if you can get away with them? That's always been the question. That's the question that was raised by Friedrich Nietzsche in the 19th century and by Dostoevsky and even more broken yeah. in some ways. So, you know, and to some extent, we now know from Jonathan Haidt's work and others that there is some biological morality in the sense that there is some feeling of guilt that we have 
even if we don't think we'll, you know, so Dostoevsky's famous portrait in Crime and Punishment, the murderer feels guilty for killing somebody, even though it's not worried to be punished in the afterlife. So there's something there to that. In the book, I also talk about the emotion of disgust. Disgust is a strong feeling of disgust is strongly, cor- which is a moral emotion. It's a feeling of something being wrong morally is strongly associated with vegetarianism and vegetarianism is strongly associated with fear of death or being contaminated yeah. with deathly essence. So there's definitely, yeah, you're touching a lot of moral impulse. Yeah. The disgust and also food, you know, religions have always had, uh, sanctions and rules about food and mixing food, what kinds of food are safe and so on. You're also kind of touching that. You define, let me just read that section from your book here. In the early 20th century, the American scholar William James defined religion as the belief in, quote, an unseen order, and that our supreme good lies in adjusting ourselves thereto. Right. The scholar Paul Tillich defined religion more broadly to include belief systems and moral frameworks. Right. For environmentalists, the unseen order we need to adjust our, is need to adjust ourselves to is nature. Right. So you have that that kind of naturalistic fallacy in a different sense that what's natural is good and what's not natural is is, is evil. Right. And then there you've tapped into those deeper religious impulses. By the way, there's two. Uh, this is a little sidebar, but there's actually the naturalistic fallacy which is the idea that you can determine what should be from what it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm using it a different way than that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and then appeal to nature fallacy is that if it's yeah. natural, well, first of all, we can yeah. decide what's natural, what's unnatural, and then if it's natural, it's good. But yeah, I, mean, yeah. I think, um, yeah, so without that morality, how do we, what do we do? Like, if there's no God, oh, so there's been, I think, right. this effort, and I think I see with Black Lives Matter, too. I'm not an expert on race and racism, but I've, I've corresponded with John McWhorter, who's this amazing mm. thinker on race and yeah. we're yeah. friendly. And I emailed him. He he said, he's like, anti-racism has become the new religion. And I was like, Oh, oh. <laughs> right. Climate apocalypse <laughs> yeah. is right up there with it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. the same people in the street, right? It's the same people. I mean, okay. I'm exaggerating. There's 90% overlap between black lives matters people and climate apocalypse people. Right. But they're all after something, right? They're seekers. There's, there's something beautiful in it. They want to be helpful to the world. There's definitely a fair amount of just virtue signaling and conspicuous yeah. compassion. But they these are also people that often are insecure about where they sit in society. And so what you find is that it's often people that feel insecure and need some or socially insecure and need some way to feel more powerful and more moral than the people around them. Another thing I was thinking of with that uh, section in your book was um, – the kind of narrative arcs you get in stories that uh, like uh, or, or philosophies like Marxism has a kind of apocalyptic arc to it where, uh, you know, capitalism must come to an utter destructive end and then communism will take us back to the garden, you know, b- back before there was private property and, and and greed and all that stuff. And even on the other side, Ayn Rand's great uh, novel, Atlas Shrugged, it's an apocalyptic doomsday uh, thing where the, in this case, the socialists have taken over and they've ruined the place and it all falls apart. Then the capitalists jump in to, to fix it at the end. But that, that, that arc that, you know, there's a beginning, a middle, and then it's almost like a, a Joseph Campbell kind of, you know, he, hero return or something like that. In this case, it's, it's some bigger system that kind of marches along inevitably. And that seems to be what environmental apocalyptic thinkers uh, are, have kind of grafted onto. Maybe it's a good way to tell a story it just, that, that comes naturally. Yeah, so I think there's sort of two separate things are going on. I try to try to pull them apart. I'm not sure I totally have it, but one is fear of death, a fear of your own death. Oh, yeah. And the and the idea here, this is from anthropology now, is that we are aware of our deaths, unlike my dog, which is not aware of her death, um, by the age of four, you know, and and that that fear is real. But you can't function if you're just going around all day being afraid of dying. So you construct a story about how you'll live on after you die, some little story that you tell yourself. And so the most famous example of this is, you know, billionaires who want to put their name on a building at Harvard. You know, it's the it's the John Smith building at Harvard. Well, I'm going to live on (laughs) forever if my name's on the building. Um, But, you know, for me, because I'm I have it, too. I write a book. I want my book and I dedicate it to my children. Right. Right. That's so to some extent, there's a natural positive impulse. The problem comes when you don't think that that's what you're doing or you have no awareness or distance from it. I think the second thing, which is related but different, is apocalypse talk. And so 
Whereas when people are really, when they think about your death, it's like, oh God, I don't want to think about that or talk about it. There's a lot of people who are excited by the idea of apocalypse, you know, right. and, and I find it's people that really are unhappy in some way. They don't like society. They feel like they want to get some power over society and they're sort of condemning it. So I always joke, it's like, like here's a group of people that just hate modern civilization, Bill McKibben. Right. Or Greta. Right. Oh, right. All this growth. It's terrible. Oh, let me tell you how to protect it. It's like, but you just said you didn't want it. So right. it's on the one right. that we have to do all these things to protect civilization, but all the things they're recommending would move us away from civilization, right? It would be like, we have to go back to all being small farmers because that seems right. like going away. Right. From, and then you get a lot of this, no, 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 that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this totally different path. Well, at the end of the day, what they're talking about is rich countries becoming poorer and poorer countries becoming a little richer. It's not that complicated. They call it sustainable development. Yeah. It's basically just trying to meet in the middle. Yeah, you quote uh, Richard Rhodes, who I've had on the podcast, and and I know him. He, he's one of my favorite writers, uh, where he equates for you environmentalism as Calvinism, which I hadn't really thought of. I really like this quote, in the sense that the world is an evil place, and it would be better if it were destroyed and turned back over to the natural kingdom. There is that sense in, in some uh, environmental activists that it's not just predicting that, that things are going to get bad. It's sort of hoping or like yes. uh, we want to help it along or, you know, it'll be great when, you know, the masses, uh, you know, are washed away or whatever. Of course, not me, but, you know, the, all those other people, especially the rich people on Wall Street. <laughs> right. Right. For sure. I mean, that's a sensitive chapter because I'm trying to you'll note if you read it, you know, when people read it, you'll note that I'm careful to not suggest that that's what Bill McKibben and Greta Thunberg's motives are. I'm not speculating about what's so great about Dick. Dick Rose, a friend of mine, um, it's one of my favorite people, um, is that he talks about himself. You know, he's he was badly abused. He wrote a whole book about how he was badly abused as a child yeah. in Kansas City. And then watching the movie, the, the nuclear uh, apocalypse movie the day after where the, the missiles are coming in to destroy Kansas City and being like, yeah, and then being like, well, wait, I'm against that. But. So I think it was nice for him to sort of share that because it was a way to sort of and he laughed. And and I think we see that in ourselves, like when you're angry or depressed at the world, you know, we get very dark. And so we tend to, you know, take pleasure in other people's suffering, which is much of what humor is, by the way. Um, yeah. You know, or or just kind of engage in these fantasies. And so, I mean, that's kind of for me where I got to at the bottom. And I think that the only way to deal with it is by affirming our love of humanity and of human civilization and remind that's what the book is trying to do is sort of, that's why I spend so much time in the Congo or in Indonesia. It's to sort of say, you know, let's appreciate this incredible civilization we've created for ourselves because I think lack of appreciation for it is one of the contributors to this apocalyptic mentality. Yeah. I like how you develop characters in your book of uh, people in poor, really poor places, not just what, Americans consider to be poor, which means you, you only have one cell phone and one big screen TV and maybe no air conditioning, something like that. The places you've worked in, oh my gosh, it's just inconceivable for us in America to know what that that's really like. Um, I think uh, the other theme I want to touch on on that area is uh, your discussion of the environment as like a cybernetic self-regulating system by early environmental scientists and, and activists in the sense that anything that mucks up the the wheels that are all all in uh, you know turning just right which is humans and civilization muck that up that you point out that it, it in itself is not a scientifically grounded analogy between the environment and say a cybernetic self-regulating system yeah that's right i mean there this is a neoplatonic idea although for today's generation i like to just sort of say the idea was that that the world and nature is like a jenga puzzle most people are familiar with the Jenga puzzle. You know, if you pull, if one species right. is extinct, when it could it out. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's something that's very powerful. You know, there was some research done. I didn't make it into the book, but shows that, you know, conser I think the thing you were saying about Ayn Rand is really interesting. Conservatives and liberals both have apocalyptic frameworks, but for, for progressives, it's that we're going to destroy the environment and it will fall apart. But for conservatives or libertarians, it's been we're going to overregulate the economy and the economy will fall apart. So the COVID, you can see this really perfectly yeah, with the COVID, yeah. the 
the current COVID debate. Right. right. Um, but yeah, so then biologists, you know, because they're doing science and even though biology is not, you know, it's not physics, much of biology, by the way, one of the, I think one of the best observations I've ever heard is that biology is all basically a kind of natural history. You know, you're just telling histories. There's mechanisms that you're describing, of course, but you're really describing what happens over time to particular places. And, you know, while there are some situations, the famous example are lakes, you know, that um, that die or that have algae blooms or switch into. But most of the time, most ecosystems, you know, unless they're being clear cut or they're being massively destroyed, species come and go. You know, and and it's not they don't come and go in this holistic sense. They kind of come and go. And and so, yeah, it's not that Edenic, beautiful, holistic picture that that got painted by a lot of the early naturalists. Yeah, it's like uh, Kevin Costner's film uh, Dances with Wolves. It kind of portrayed that what I call the beautiful people myth. You know, long, long ago, there was these beautiful people that lived in perfect harmony with the environment until the e evil Europeans came. Well, you know, we know from environmental historians that Native Americans uh, decimated large populations of forests and animals and so on. And that so so did Pop, uh, Papua New Guineans. And the, the first, the Maori people of New Zealand with the big Moa birds, you know, this is what uh, what people do. And But in fact, so do predators. Uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, th th there is no perfect state of harmony for the environment, is your point. Yeah, and I see in it all just a desire to return to the womb, you know, a kind of, to a, a sort of a simpler place. It's a childlike I mean, it's Rousseauian, right? So, I mean, there is it does yeah. dressed into more sophisticated ideologies, but there's a kind of desire, like especially when you're like, you know, I think you teenagers, you know, when you're exposed to how terrible the world is in so many ways, and then you, it's very easy to kind of fantasize well, a world that doesn't have any of that. I mean, that's, right. that's ancient, um, and then sort of insisting that I know how to create that world. <laughs> You right. know, the, there's well, there's the tricky part because then again, you're moralizing and you're telling people, other people, what they should or shouldn't do. So let's just go through some of the the highlights of the book here, just the bigger the bigger points that people care about. Global warming is real and human caused. From there, how much warmer is it going to get over what time frame? Fifty years, hundred years? What will the consequences of that warming be? What, what what's your best guess on that from having studied this? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it's actually being, it's in the New York Times today, it's being debated. I mean, traditionally, scientists said if you double the CO2 in the atmosphere from 280 parts per million to 560, temperatures will increase either b between 1.5 and 4.5 Celsius over industrial levels. So that's a pretty big range. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's, you know, now they say, oh, it's not going to be 1.5. It could be 2, you know, or two to 4.5 and some people say it could be five. And so you get the activist scientists that are always trying to push the other end, but that level of uncertainty, I mean, that we haven't done much better than that. I mean, that's basically the broad level of uncertainty. What has changed is cheap natural gas everywhere, not just fracking yeah. in the United States, which is what, uh, you know, from the shale underground, but in offshore gas drilling, I mean, Africa has these huge deposits, you know, there's, there's huge natural gas deposits all over the world. So that's, Great, because there's no chance that we're going to have what they, you know, the worst, the highest levels of warming in the model that the IPCC uses would have us, would, we would have to quintuple the amount of coal we are projected to use. But we're not going to do that because we have so much natural gas. And then my view is, and natural gas, by the way, it's just on its, it's fine. It doesn't really need any environmental activism to make the case for natural gas, because most people know natural gas is better than coal. Bigger, bigger problem is that we would never do nuclear because we're so scared of it. And so a, a world of pure natural gas is still a pretty darn warm world. So what I say to people is I say, look, if you're really concerned about climate change, then you should be a nuclear advocate. My view is when people go, how hot will the world get? And I'm like, well, you know, outside of that sensitivity, that climate sensitivity of the temperature, it's just how much nuclear we do. Like, that's kind of it. Like, stop, you know, I, I, this is where, you know, Bjorn, I do, I, my view of this is a little different than Bjorn Lomborg, who you had on a couple of weeks ago. I think Bjorn and people like William Nordhaus, who won the Nobel Prize, who I have a huge amount of respect for, they want to kind of suggest that there's some model where they can get some certainty. And I think that they're often trying to 
show too much certainty as opposed to like, you know, all else being equal, we wouldn't want any warming at all. And the reason for that is that we have all of our agricultural systems and cities and our and the protected areas for endangered species. They're all kind of set up for a particular temperature. So you go increase it and the species we now know might migrate to the poles and you get other problems. But not all else is equal. So, you know, obviously cheap, abundant energy is the source of our prosperity and well-being. And so 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 it is it isn't all else being equal. And I always, you know, it's not it didn't make it in yeah. the book, but I point out that, you know, William Nordhaus, who Bjorn relies on a lot, he he his models show that four degrees is the optimal temperature when you count all the costs and benefits of fossil fuels and the, you know, obviously the consequences of climate change. Looks like we're going to be at closer to three. It's not great. Would rather be yeah. zero, but it's also not. I mean, it's, it's not like nothing's going to happen at three or four degrees or five degrees. Uh, heaven forbid, you know, that would remove my flood control system from Berkeley. Right. Right. You know, it's just like that, or my our whole like civilization collapse. I'm kind of like, what would happen? I mean, the only scenario is that we grow less food. But that doesn't I mean, that just depends on whether poor countries get access to fertilizer, irrigation and tractors. It's not dependent on whether you're at three or four degrees. So so I think there's just been I think there's never even really been a clear mechanism for people to describe the really catastrophic scenarios. Um, doesn't mean there's risks, but they're just at a completely different level than where the discourse has been. Those those massive error bars, is that because there's so many factors you have to program into a model and the models vary depending on who's building them and so on? And if you carry it out 50 years or 100 years or 500 years, it just becomes so fuzzy it's meaningless? Yeah, I mean, for sure. So so one of the big error bars is that climate sensitivity, which is just how much warmer does it get if you double CO2 or you increase CO2? So that's one. Yeah. There's other uncertainties, you know, like one of them I didn't even make it into the book, but, you know, I was when I was doing the research on the Amazon, I was actually arguing with the scientist who does all this tipping point stuff, which I just think is not science. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But um, he was like he was it's funny because they tell you things and he, he goes um, he goes, well, you know, the real issue with the Amazon is we thought it was going to get wetter like 10 years ago. And now we think it's going to get drier. And you're, mm. what are the chances that we're going to change our mind about that again? <laughs> you know, and they kind of go, oh, right. no, no, now we know, now we know. And yeah, you, know, you kind of go. So, you know, but then I think the biggest one is just what are we going to do? Are we going to build a lot of nuclear power plants or are we going to burn a lot of gas? Um, and then also, how do we respond to the temperature increases that we get? So what Bernadette in the Congo needs is a hydroelectric dam, industrialization, urbanization, liquid, liquefied petroleum gas, so they can stop using wood as fuel, um, and they can create flood control systems. So yeah. it kind of goes, what will determine the future? It depends on what we do. I think what's clear is that we're not going to sit around and be helpless. We're not going to suddenly become helpless. You know, this thing of sea right. level rise, it's like, okay, so sea level is going to rise two feet between now and 2100. That's the median estimate from IPCC. What are we going to just, what do you think that like, we're all just going to sit there and just let ourselves, you know, let the, <laughs> right. and you, you right. people, they right. kind of go, you read the scientists and they go, well, we might have to abandon some coastline areas. Great. That would be great <laughs> as an environmentalist. Yeah, I hope so. Can we turn it into wetlands right. and habitat? I mean, so it's this weird thinking, which is like, like, oh, my God, there's going to be environmental change and we're just going to be like, whoa. And that's why I always talk with the Netherlands, because it's like, you know, here's a country that became rich right? in sometimes seven meters below sea level. It didn't make them poor. I think I can't make the case. I've, I've, I've looked at it. I can't make the case that living below sea level made them rich, but it certainly right. it must have con didn't stop contributed them. to their engineering skills. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, so you you walk us through in the book from the sort of crudest forms of of energy, dung and wood and whatever's lying around you could burn to fossil fuels like oil, to natural gas, to nuclear. Where does solar and wind and other renewables fit in there? And you all always hear these conflicting numbers of like we can do totally n renewables and have no nuclear, no problem. Here's what we got to do. And then you see other numbers that go, no, you'd have to cover the entire United States with solar panels or windmills or whatever to get the same uh, amount from nuclear power. 
So what's your best take on, on those estimates? Yeah, so the first, th- and this is a theme that runs through the book, there is a concept in energy analysis called power density. There's actually two concepts. One is energy density, and that refers to the fuel. So a lump of coal has twice as much energy as a lump of wood. Lump of uranium has a million times more than that lump of coal. So that's energy density of the fuel. But then there's something called power density, which can be applied to anything. Um, Coal mines, natural gas, nuclear power plants, uranium mines, cities, farms. That's just simple. It's just simply measuring the power consumed or produced and the amount of land. And so – what I argue in the book, and again, I'm, and by the way, you know, the whole book rests on other people's research. I was really careful not to be like, I figured this out, not just cause, yeah. because yeah. I, because I wanted to be able to refer to peer reviewed and scientific literature. So, so in terms of land use, renew, there's basically three kinds of energy, just simply renewables, fossil fuels, and nuclear. That's it. And renewables are, you know, are sunlight, tidal, wind, geothermal. I mean, arguably wind is a form of solar energy, so is wood. Um, But what distinguishes renewables from fossil fuels is the dilute nature of the fuel, whether that's wood or sunlight. So you have to gather a lot of natural resource. In the case of solar and wind, it's about three to 400 times more land to generate the same amount of electricity as a nuclear plant or natural gas plant. So the big dog of energy analysis, a guy whose name is Václav Smil. Um, yeah. Va- Václav Smil. Bill Gates cites him all the time. Bill Gates cites him all the time. I've known him for, you know, 10 years. I like him. I don't actually agree with him on his conclusions, which in, for me just makes him more special because he he's right on the facts, even if we don't agree on what the implications are. He's a Malthusian. So, but mm. yeah. He writes a whole book on power density. It's this incredible book. It's so boring. Nobody should read it. It's technical and whatever. <laughs> but but it's like he just went and just did a bunch of these power density measures. By the way, they're really easy to do. Now you, go to, so you can go to Google Maps and just draw a circle around a power plant. And then you can multiply. You can wow. divide by the electricity. He does a whole book on it. And at the end of it, the punchline, he goes, if we went to 100% renewables for energy, which is, by the way, it's electricity, cooking, heating, and transportation, not just electricity – you would have to go from using a half a percent of land in the United States for energy to between 25 and 50 percent. It's an astonishing oh amount of land. Yeah. So, yeah. so you kind of go, well, where does he get that? Um, it's these bottom up calculations, but it also has a lot of face validity because remember I mentioned the solar. We, we do our own, but we find the solar and wind farms have two orders of magnitude. They require two orders of magnitude more more land. Well, that's what. You know, that's what 20, you know, 25 and 50 uh, percent would be two orders of magnitude more than a half a percent. So, I mean, it has a lot of face validity. And now we just see that even in Germany, but also the United States in Northern California, this is the most hippie green part of California. They keep opposing (laughs) wind farms. They don't like and who's opposing them. It's conservationists. You know, the renewable energy industry is always like, oh, these are Koch brother funded climate deniers. Nine, nine times out of 10, these are people that are like birders, conservationists. Right. I profile one of them in my book. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a really shocking thing. Obviously, if I'm right and that renewables are worse for the environment than fossil fuels, that's there's pretty significant implications for environmental policy. Um, By the way, so, you, you I, I thought your book really indicted some of these environmental groups that take money from fossil fuels companies uh, or, or people and then a- activate against nuclear, which is going to help their sponsors. It seems a little hypocritical, if not worse. It's shocking. And it all happens in broad daylight. <laughs> the two biggest fossil fuel donors two environmental groups that I know of, I should say, are Tom Steyer and Mike Bloomberg, <laughs> both of whom ran for president, yeah, and, and and like reporters, with some ex- important exceptions, give these guys a pass. They kind of go, oh, well, but it doesn't matter because now he talks about renewables. It's like, but right. they're funding efforts to shut down nuclear plants and replace them mostly with natural gas because solar panels and wind turbines only provide electricity 20 to 40% of the time, often when you don't need it. 
So, so I mean, it's kind of amazing that, you know, there was this, I mean, and not only that, but the amounts of money, I think we calculated Exxon spent, like, they gave something, I mean, a s- small amount of money, a few tens of millions to climate deniers over its entire many years. But the average annual budget of a big environmental group is around $100 million a year. So, I mean, wow. they massively outspend Exxon every year, massively <laughs> Koch brothers. And half the time, those guys, they're not funding climate denial. They're funding groups like American Enterprises. Right. Institute, yeah. Which, Frank Think Tank, it's a Repu- traditional conservative Republican think tank, um, but they don't deny that climate change is happening. In fact, AEI advocates a carbon price, a carbon tax, and money for R&D. So like half the time, you look at this and you go, you're not even attacking climate deniers. <laughs> right. And yeah, People yeah. That money from these guys. So, well, following your chain of reasoning and the numbers you present in the book, it seems like nuclear is a no-brainer, but it seems like the obstacles are mostly psychological, political, or you know, non-technical. Uh, it seems like we we could have the technology if, if say they were allowed to fail, like the airline industry did in the twenties and thirties, where, where where they experimented until they got it right, and, and now it's the safest way to travel. We've never done that with nuclear. But 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 why is that? It seems like there's something in the human mind that is repelled by a, an energy source you can't see, smell, taste, touch. It's like this invisible demonic force that, that could be cut loose. Well, I mean, in some ways it is a demonic force. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah. I mean, it's it's amazing. <laughs> it though, bonds, right? it so, is. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, um, you know, which, by the way, you know, I mean, because people look at intentions. I think it's not only the only way to look at it, but, you know, even the bomb, it was created to prevent war and end war. And that's all it's ever done. That's all it's mm-hmm. ever done. It's never been used to start wars. Um, and now we see India and China. Um, their war, you know, just is like a little skirmish because both because generals on both sides of the border know exactly what's at stake. So. But yeah, I do argue that I think that the animating that force of nuclear is fear of the bomb. And and because the technology is so new, I mean, people think nuclear is old. I just laugh. I mean, 10,000 years, you know, unless the aliens give us their anti-gravity technology, Michael, <laughs> which I know you believe. In. Um, um, 10,000 years from now, we're still going to look back and be like nuclear was this revolutionary moment. You know, I mean, even if you get fusion. I don't I mean, I just think fission is just still it's not that different from fission and fusion. So yeah. so you still go. It's crazy technology. You can create massive quantities of heat from tiny amounts of matter. So and then it comes out on the bomb and then the left for a variety of reasons campaigns against nuclear weapons. And then it and then the fears displace themselves onto the power plants in an almost spiritual way in the sense that. Nuclear, it's only for me as an adolescent even, I remember thinking there was something really sinister about nuclear power plants. I couldn't put my finger on it, you know, and it was always this sort of overhang that humans had gone too far, you know, that we'd always gone too far. The problem, of course, with nuclear is that it comes right out of, well, because you know Dick Rhodes. I mean, it comes, this is his whole, one of his great contributions is just, it just comes right out of physics, you know, we think of the Manhattan Project, which was this huge industrial wartime effort. That's different. But splitting the atom, I mean, that's dudes yeah. in their labs. So right. there's there's really no scenario to get rid of this technology, which was the impulse from a lot of people was to get rid of it. Nobody could figure out how to do it. They tried to do it. Even if you killed every nuclear scientist in the world, it would just emerge out of human experimentation. So, so and then the bombs itself, I point out in the book, that a few people, Niels Bohr, the great Danish physicist, and and these Yale professors, they realized very early that you weren't going to be able to get rid of the bomb because two countries that had the bomb, like the Soviet Union, United States, if they got rid of it and then went to war, the first thing they would do would be race to build bombs and possibly use right. them for each other. So I just think that that anxiety has been so powerful, so scary that it hangs over the technology and so I talk about it because, you know, the nuclear industry, you know, and the nuclear scientific and technical community, they just hate it when I talk about this because they want to pretend there's a bit of a good child, bad child thing. The nuclear energy industry has always been like, we're the good kids. You know, we're the new, the peaceful nuclear energy and all the weapons stuff is the bad kids. 
But I just think it ends up backfiring and everybody just looks at the technology as a whole as something sinister and to be a ball. Yeah. Well, you have that great line in the book about um, Three Mile Island happening like the same week that the China Syndrome Jane Fonda movie came out. And, and so people kind of put those together in their mind. And now our collective his, our collective memory is like, oh, yeah, there's something really bad about that. And that translates into even people like my friend Bill Nye, the science guy, who has been pretty, pretty much anti-nuclear. Oh, yeah. And when I point out, you know, no one's died in the United States and, 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 and the numbers for Chernobyl and, you know, are much lower than we thought they were going to be and on and on. And 3,000 people die every year in coal plants or and much more than that in coal related and fossil fuel related uh, lung diseases and on and on. Uh, you know, his response, which I, th- I think reflects the anti-nuclear sentiment, is just you wait when the big one happens, the real meltdown, the total collapse and, you know, and L.A. is radiated or whatever city, uh, then then you'll see why that was always a bad idea. And then Bill says something like, OK, so you take however many nuclear plants there are now. I forget how many there are. Uh, but you multiply that by 10, say, if we went the route you're, you're proposing, that just increases by tenfold the risks of a huge, massive meltdown. So what's your response to that? Yeah, I mean, Bill is um, he's totally apocalyptic. Um, he was apocalyptic about nuclear. Then he becomes apocalyptic about climate change. I'm, I know he's your friend, but I have to say I find his style very kind of bullying um, and 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 kind of just unhinged. I mean, he did this thing on climate where he's like, let me show you what climate change is. And he like just has like a globe and then shoots like (laughs) WD-40 and fire on it. And I'm just kind of like, you know, one out of five British children are having nightmares about climate change. I interviewed my (laughs) 14 year old daughter's friends. They don't know if they're going to live long enough to have kids. Bill Nye is this like major figure for adolescents and kids, or at least he was. And yeah. to, go, to, to go around and, 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 and misrepresenting the science in the way that he's done, I think is irresponsible. Um, you know, and then for him to then for him to do what everybody else does and turn around and say, oh, no, we can't do nuclear. Well, great, Bill. So basically what you're saying is that we're doomed. It's not based on any science. Um, and there's a kind of style I find where it's like he doesn't want to talk about it. He doesn't want to debate it. He wants to just hector and kind of call people names. So anyway, I don't mean to pick on Bill Nye, but I do find that this particular style, it's really quite um, um, reactionary and, and kind of bullying in their, in their, in their ways that they dismiss people yeah. that are raising other substantive issues. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna send him a copy of your book. I have two copies, so I'll I'll send him one. And uh, we did change his mind on GMOs. He was anti-GMO, and then he went uh-huh. to Monsanto and discovered that you know they're not Satan there. So he changed his mind. So it's it's possible. But, That's good. But, but in terms of what his arguments represent, this that it's too risky to go nuclear. Right. Yeah. So clearly, so you kind of go what you just said. I mean, so look, the data you know is clear. These accidents, and I go through it in my book. They just aren't as they just didn't have the impact that people think they had. So Chernobyl, I speak to the world's one of the world's leading Chernobyl experts whose mother died of leukemia. She's a completely independent medical researcher, one of the top scholars. She thinks somewhere around 200 people total will die from Chernobyl. I mean, that's like fewer people than die in a single jet plane goes down. Right. I mean, right. that was like worse. I mean, that was like 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 nuclear fuel is being spewed into the atmosphere. So I think that. Even on those accidents, we're projecting kind of bond. And yeah. I think it's interesting. Chernobyl occurs really at this at the new Cold War. You know, after de- after all the detente stuff, Reagan comes back in. So I think that everybody was like, ah. Uh. Um, so clearly, like this can't just be about the nuclear power plants. You know, and even when he goes, even I hear it in the language when when he goes, well, you're going to have all this proliferating nuclear power plants all around the world. Well, first of all, there's so there's 60 about 60 nuclear power plant sites in the United States. The cheapest way to expand nuclear, the best way, is just to add reactors there. But the mm-hmm. picture you get from Bill is like, oh my gosh, the weapons will spread. You know, then mm. nuclear will proliferate around the world, and I think that's kind of what's got to be underneath it. And and also, you got to point out that that uh, Chernobyl was not a, a, a anything like a design that we use, and and there were some design flaws in it, and the way the test was done. What about Fukushima? What's your response to that when people point that out? 
I mean, same thing. I mean, I think that what's complex, what adds to the complexity around that is that Japan actually is the only country in the world that has ever suffered a nuclear attack. Um, so I think they, and there was a lot of, there was more, there was radiation sickness. And so there's a whole kind of, you mm-hmm. know, um, I think it's tied up with kind of national shame as well around Japanese imperialism in World War II. I mean, there's mm. Japanese people, when you spend time in Japan, there are older Japanese people who will tell you, we're really glad that you guys bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's completely taboo to say it. But, you know, the estimates mm. were that like a million American soldiers would die and millions of Japanese yeah, yeah, soldiers yeah. would die. And so, but that even idea is totally taboo. So there was that. And then, of course, 15,000 people had just been killed by a tsunami right before the nuclear plant melted down. So I even see some displacement in that. People will mm. go, well, Fukushima, yeah, 15,000 people died. It's like, well, but they died from a tsunami. They're swept away right. by nature. Right. So then it maps onto the power plant. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. You know, but like, according to the best. And, of- and just to, clar- just yeah. to clarify that, it was the seawalls was the problem, right? The, the, the ocean uh, yeah. went, went over the seawall. They just weren't built high enough. Yeah, the seawalls weren't built high enough. And then they kept the backup power generators that would have powered the pumps to keep the water flowing over the reactors had been put under water. I mean, sorry, to put underground mm. to protect them from earthquakes. Mm. And then the water flooded them and damaged right. them. Right. The seawall right. story is even more interesting because the reason the plant manager failed to raise the seawall when they knew they needed to is that he didn't want to scare the local town people that there could be a tsunami that could take out the nuclear plant. I just think it's such a, it's such a poignant story because, but that's very Japan too, you know, but there is a sort of that fear, which was like, we don't want to scare anybody. And then of course it ends up backfiring in the ways that it backfired, but look, no deaths from radiation, you know, probably hundreds or maybe thousands of deaths from suicide, depression, anxiety, right. all terrible things. So yeah. I don't think there's a problem in the technology exactly. I mean, really what you find with jet jet planes and nuclear plants, the trajectory are the exact same. You know, it's like you see those graphs where it's like mm. you know, miles traveled goes like that for, for, air, for airplanes and deaths goes down like that. It's basically the same yeah. with, with nuclear. And in both cases, it's really human factors. Sure, you know, there's better machines, better human interface with the machines, but it's human factors, which means training, professionalism, checklists, all the boring stuff that we yeah. do to improve improve technical operations. That's what makes nuclear safer. Let's hit a few of the other uh, high points of the book. The Earth's lungs are not burning. Of course, that, everybody remembers the Amazon on fire story. I guess that was about a year and a half ago. Celebrities tweeting the wrong pictures out and, you know, be, blame, blaming capitalism or blaming civilization or whatever. What's the story on, on the Amazon and is it the Earth's lungs? Well, so this is a, a, a very personal story, too, because I, 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 I was training to be an anthropologist. I lived in the Amazon with small Mm. farmers i knew how bad life was i had already done a i did my previous book i had done a chapter on the amazon i knew the top scientist who writes on the amazon for the ipcc so i knew that the lungs of the world thing was not true but he's a great (laughs) guy yeah said he's the hero of that chapter i call him up and i'm like hey is the amazon the lungs of the world and he's like no it's total bullshit there's actually two (laughs) There's two separate myths that got mixed together. The first is that it's the lungs of the world. Well, the lungs absorb oxygen, emit carbon, okay? But then the other is that the Amazon is an oxygen supply device mm. or something. That's not true either. So what it what it turns out, I added a whole paragraph to, the, to that chapter explaining why the Amazon uses as much oxygen as it produces. It uses the oxygen as fuel in the process of respiration, which is the breakdown of biomass and plant matter in forests. I didn't think it was necessary, but I had enough readers who read the early draft and they were like, I still don't believe that the Amazon isn't producing oxygen because I think we've had so much Mm -hmm. misinformation about how plants produce oxygen that they think it's a net oxygen producer. The big argument of the chapter, though, there's two big arguments. The first is just that Brazil is doing what Europe and the United States did. I mean, it's just clearing land for agriculture. It's how we grew rich, and now we're condemning them for it. Um, 
Would we like to not have any rainforest destruction? Of course. I mean, even the people that live in the Amazon, not even the people, I mean, especially the people that live in the Amazon, they don't like the deforestation. They would love some other way to make a living. They're doing it because they're very poor and desperate. But then the other thing I discovered, and this is really from my source, Dan, by encouraging a kind of small as beautiful agroecology mm -hmm. where you're sort of mixing farming and nature preservation together, they, Greenpeace ended up promoting fragmentation of the mm. forest. So what, what you really want to do is concentrate your farming in what's, the, what's known as the Sahadu, which is the savanna region below the Amazon, not as high quality biodiversity. Concentrate farming there so you can conserve the Amazon. Greenpeace promoted the exact opposite, and it's had devastating consequences. So that was kind of the punchline of that chapter. Yeah. Well, that and, um, you know, in terms of like saving the whales and species extinction and all that, you show how it was innovation and I guess capitalism, if you will, uh, that put an end to the whale trade just by replacing what the fuel was doing with a, a different, cheaper fuel. It's kind of a model for what we should be doing going forward. Yeah, for sure. There's sort of two separate arguments there. I mean, the first is that we save nature by not using it and we don't use it when we create artificial substitutes. So I give the example of the whales. We save the whales twice, first time by using petroleum rather than whale oil, the second time by using vegetable oil rather than whale oil for margarine and soap. That was all in Europe. But then one of my favorite examples of this, it's called the substitution effect. My favorite example is the is in my plastics chapter, the <laughs> sea turtles, you know, so I start with this famous viral video of a oh, woman. Terrible, just a terrible yeah. image. <laughs> pulling the plastic straw out of the sea turtle's nose. Well, one of the species that, that she works with is the hawksbill tortoise. And we decimated mm. the hawksbill tortoise. Why? To make tortoise shell glasses like these. Oh, you can see right. that's, that's oh, the yeah. artificial tortoise shell. Oops. Yeah. Um, yeah. So – it's not tortoise, it's sea turtle shell. They, whatever, back in the day, they got them all confused, so they called it tortoise shell. But so the great punchline is that plastics help to save the sea turtles. <laughs> uh, right. Now, in terms of the capitalism, you know, the story of how we saved the whales, you know, was definitely capitalist production. It's, it can be brutal, right? Like in Congo, palm oil, you know, was part of a barbaric. And same thing in Indonesia. So it's not a total celebration of capitalism, but it did point out that just a huge number of whales were killed after we had cheaper artificial substitutes in the form of vegetable oil because the Soviet Union politically allowed its whalers mm. to keep whaling. So when you're deciding mm – -hmm. so the price signal is very important because the price signal tells us – when we have cheaper, more abundant artificial alternatives, and if you repress that price signal as the Soviet Union did under communism, they ended up just killing way more whales than they needed to because we had these better right. substitutes. Right. Well, and in conjunction with capitalism, you always hear about sweatshops. So I'll <clears throat> show the picture of the, woman, the young woman you have in the book there and read the caption that says, "This is her name is Suparti, left her home in the countryside at the age of 17 to work in factories in the city. Even when life was hard, she didn't want to go back to the farm life. I think that's very counterintuitive to Westerners. Sort of, although does any of us want to go back and work on the farm? Well, no, no, but what we think of, <laughs> yeah. not, not me, I don't want to do that, but we should let them do that. They should be free to be uh, uh, get yeah. out of the sweatshops yeah. and go back to... Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, the easy I mean, work on the farm. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the, the the one of the environmental journalists with like the most Twitter followers on Twitter, a guy named Eric Holthouse, he has a half almost a half a million Twitter followers, accused me of promoting white supremacy oh, because I yes. because I oppose and criticize the policies that allow Suparti to basically become a liberated woman. I mean. You know, like women on like we've completely forgotten women on the farm don't have a lot of choices, including like who they marry. Well, if you move to the city, I mean, like and this happened with her, um, she decided who she would marry, you know, gays. I mean, think about gays and lesbians. There's not a lot of opportunities to be gay on the farm. Like, what, what are you talking about? Like, that's all because right. of cities. Um, right. 
right. trans activists. They should be pro-capitalist development. You know, so you know that that these individual freedoms are a consequence of living in the city and of our prosperity. And so, you know, I I, I just wanted to tell such a simple story of Suparti's, and I wanted to tell through Suparti's yeah. eyes. Well, her story, I think, is not that uncommon. When we read about sweatshops in China, for example, um, and, and then American activists or Western activists go there to try to get them back to the farm, and they don't want to go back. They 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 want those jobs. When jobs yeah. when there's job openings, they line up like three thousand people for one thousand job openings in one of these so-called sweatshops. So, in a way, they're voting with their feet of what they want. I think that's a great I love that expression voting with their feet. I think that's exactly what's happening. You know, people are the argument traditionally they go, why you why Michael Schellenberger are you imposing this mm. way of life on Suparti? Suparti can go back to the farm any day she wants. Right. Her right. parents right. were even fine with that. In fact, her parents didn't want her to go. I mean, in some ways her story is super archetypal or common, right? Her parents didn't want her to go to the city. She wanted to go to the city. And she suffered, you know, she worked at a Barbie factory and her supervisors were abusive and she quit, um, you know, and, and but she didn't want to go back to the farm. She wanted to get a better job and she got a better job. I mean, when I met her, she was, I think, 22. She had a motor scooter, a flat screen TV. She cooked with liquefied petroleum gas rather than with wood. And she bought a home. I mean, my st- my staff is in their 20s. We're in the Bay Area. They can't dream of buying a home. You know, um, obviously her home yeah. is very modern. But but this idea that 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 she's oppressed in the city, it's just a complete fabrication. It's not to say that it's all good times, but where did that right. even come from? It only comes from rich people in the rich world. Right. And of course, we don't have the memory or, or history of what it was like, say, two centuries ago in the United States when it was 90 percent agriculture and now it's three percent agriculture. Well, you know, what happened to all that suppression of people moving to the cities and, and into factory jobs, uh, which is your point. But yeah. but the other point, I think also maybe it, there's a hypocrisy of us imposing our values. We've already gone through our industrial revolution. We've made the transition to cleaner fuels and so on. We're on our way. But you, sir, you have to stop what you're doing because you're polluting the app. Well, how about you let me get through that stage? And maybe you help me get through it faster than it took you a century to do it. I want to do it in 10 years. Something like that would be the way to go. Oh, yeah. I mean, gosh, I mean, you can't spend any time with Suparty or Bernadette and wish for them the status quo. You want them to see them improve their lives. You know, one of the most interesting things is. I argue that actually using more energy is good for people and nature and that the goal is to use less matter. It's a weird word. I can't figure out a better word, but less materials. So, you know, of course, this is one of the greatest dematerializing inventions of all times. If you have an iPhone, you don't need to use newspapers, (laughs) uh, cameras, all the other stuff. But it requires a lot of energy. And so and I point out that um, for Suparti's income – she uses the same amount of energy that people in the United States used when they were at her level of income. And that surprises people because because everything's more efficient. But she yeah. efficiency just means that she has access to cell phones and television sets and all the other stuff. So energy is good. Energy's not the enemy. The enemy is 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 relying on natural resource. It's relying on sea turtles and whale oil and wood for fuel. And we wanna to some extent it, the, the it sounds weird. But if you want to save nature, we need to use more artificial products. It's the opposite yeah. of how people think about it. I think here you're also running into some uh, anti-capitalism or anti-greed or or something like income inequality concerns uh, that have nothing to do with the environment and just everything to do with uh, you know the seeming unfairness of some capitalism. Some of this is, to be sure, what I call a Dallas view of capitalism remember that show dallas uh, you know oh, about sure. the corrupt family and greedy family or or, or call it the uh uh well who is the scammer um uh uh madoff. The, the guy that pull, yeah made off sort of the bernie made off view of capitalism yes there are people like that but in terms of just the people on the bottom that just want to crawl out of uh, out of the gutter and have three square meals a day and a roof on their head and so on there's no faster more efficient tool to get there than trade and 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 property rights and 
these kinds of freedoms we take for granted. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, um, you know, it's not to say there's not, you know, brutality and oppression and exploitation. Of course there is, but it's just, how would you, how could you deny the progress that's been made? I give the example of my, one of my aunts who lived through the great depression. And I was like, one of, one of her favorite, I asked her one of her happiest memories when she was a child. It was when her mother got a clothes wringer just to wring out mm. the water from the clothes she, just by hand. I mean, right, right. I mean, right. I mean, we're so spoiled now. If you go ask a kid now, what was your happiest memory? It'd be like, I don't know, when I got my own iPhone or something. It wouldn't be when my mother's hands were scared <laughs> right. from yeah. wringing yeah, yeah. clothes all day. So, and that's, I think that's ultimately what we're dealing with here is that, you know, when you are living a life of prosperity and you stop believing in God and you don't, and after you, if you think you just become worm food after you die, you kind of go, what's, why am I here? What's the purpose of that? My grandfather, he never asked himself that question. And mm. it's not a criticism of him, but he knew right. his job. He knew he was created by God to work the farm and to be a good Christian. He was a pacifist Mennonite, by the way. But he that was inherited mm. by him. There was no existential mm. – he never had an existential crisis. But that yeah. is our challenge is that we do have that and, and it's figuring out how to how to handle that and how to deal with the broader societal consequences of it that I think we're really struggling with. Yeah. In 2014, I was on the L.A. Times Book Prize Committee and we awarded Elizabeth Colbert's book, The Sixth Extinction, as our science book of the year. I have to admit, you know, I read it and she's a great writer, so that helps. But I, I, I just swallowed all of it. You know, OK. I guess I have to face this fact there's a sixth extinction. We're in the middle of it. And, of course, Greta Thunberg uh, emphasizes again a few about a year ago, I guess now. Uh, but so what's wrong with the sixth extinction hypothesis? Are we in it? What's the deal with Ed Wilson's? Uh, what is it? His species area model that it appears to be mistaken. Yeah. So there's just the so, first of all, a sixth extinction is somewhere between like 50 or 70 percent of species going extinct, we're not causing that. I mean, it's point. I think annually it's something like 0.001 percent of species become extinct. Mm. Um, you know, um, I don't even really get into it, but, you know, extinctions occurred before humans were here is the other thing. Um, but um, so it's just a gross, <laughs> gross exaggeration. Now, I think the other thing is that I think extinction is just a headline grabber. You know, there ha humans have reduced the number of wild animals on Earth by about half since 1970. Well, if you care mm -hmm. about wild animals, as most of us do, that is a tragedy. That's what happens when you go from being a billion human beings on Earth to 7.5 billion human beings. I mean, environmental problems are real, right? Um, but is it helpful And by, you know, to just sort of say it's a mass extinction? I don't think it is. One of the conservation biologists I quote in the book – says, if you really think that we're in the midst of a sixth mass extinction, why do anything? Just give up and, you know, just right. enjoy your last moments on Earth. It's bizarre. Um, the species area model, the way they did this is that they just overestimated how much land various species would need um, to survive. And it just turns out that a lot of anim plant and animal species can survive with fewer numbers. So we see mm -hmm. this all the time, the whooping crane, mm -hmm. you know, what there's like less than a thousand whooping cranes you you know they're spectacular birds i would love to see more whooping cranes it's it's um they, they're not gonna they're not going extinct you know they're endangered we should like to have mountain gorillas another one you know now over a thousand mountain gorillas it's just sad that there's only a thousand mountain gorillas because they're right, amazing right species. on the other hand the reason there's no habitat for them is because people are really poor and they're pushing their inefficient their land inefficient free range organic farming into gorilla habitat you don't need to add anything to this that's bad enough that's hard it's something that we want to solve but we don't need to like what is the need the, this desire to turn these things into apocalypse is unhelpful and as an addition to being unscientific it's depressing and wrong also, I think it shortchanges the environmentalist movement of the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Like, are you saying they did nothing? That we've right. made no progress? And therefore, what's the point? 
Yeah. Why not just say we're screwed? I'm going to go eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> right. Okay. So, but 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 carrying on here. So, speaking of eating uh, meat, should I quit eating meat because it's going to save a lot of water and energy because it's so inefficient? You know, if you want to quit eating meat, that's up to you. But it is there's it's not going to have any impact on not having any significant impact on climate change. You know, when I interviewed my daughter's friends, what's shot? So what, what's they're apocalyptic and completely ignorant. I mean, I'm not putting them down. They just don't know anything. And it's be, and, right, and so right. the apocalypse stuff is based on not knowing anything. They thought maybe plastic straws were causing climate change. I mean, from their perspective, the big drivers of climate <laughs> change are plastic straws and meat. So the <laughs> right. best available data is if you go vegetarian, you'll reduce your carbon emissions somewhere between 2 and 4%. Um, meat does have big land use can, I should say meat can have large land use impacts, but you can grow, like you can have free range cattle that take up a hundred times more land than traditional, you know, modern beef farming. You can just concentrate yeah. animals. Um, are there animal welfare? Con- I mean, the, that chapter, by the way, is a fun chapter. Cause I just plastic waste and meat were the two things I knew the least about when I wrote this yeah. book and got to bring my beginner, my Buddhist beginner mind to the problems and think <laughs> kind of freshly about them. But on the meat stuff, for me, it was like, I just wanted to go through the big arguments. And so are there animal welfare concerns when you concentrate the animals? Could be, although it turns out that actually the things that animals care about are things like having a clean stall and not having scary swinging chains. I I write about Temple Grandin, who's done this amazing, you know, um, what about diet? Is it bad for your health? That all appears to be, have been junk science, you know, and now yeah. Now we know that carbs, it appears that carbs, there's a mechanism in which they're very, they, they, they harm the insulin regulation of the body. I didn't spend a ton of time on it, but I kind of go through the arguments and it kind of looks like what it seems like humans evolved to eat, a, eat meat and it appears that we benefit from it. And yes, there's environmental impacts. A quarter of the ice-free surface of the earth we use for pasture and livestock. The good news is the amount of land we use for meat production peaked 20 years ago, and we use almost an Alaska's worth less land now, thanks to mm. more concentration of beef production. So, you know, it's not – that's one of the most – by the way, that, that one fact of declining land used for meat production is maybe the most important environmental metric. Nobody's heard of it, but when you consider that that's one of the biggest uses of land by humans, the fact that it's going in the other direction now it should make us – really happy and celebrate but, that. But, but why is it doing that? Are they uh, factory farms? Because those are pretty, well, pretty are, dreadful. Yeah. Um, you know, I, look yeah at I mean, that. here we're getting, a, yeah. Well, I look here at, we're mixing two, two different moral values or two different problems, you know, with meat is that, you know, there's ethical concerns. And even, even though I'm not a vegan or vegetarian, I'm sort of a reducitarian. I try not to eat too much meat <laughs> just to help. But, um, but, but when you watch the fact, those hidden camera factory farm, uh, movies that have been made, it's just dreadful, just awful. I mean, it makes me feel like, all right, we, we, th- this really needs to be addressed. But then when you try to work out the numbers, which I did when I was writing my chapter in the moral arc on animal rights of, could we feed everybody all seven and a half billion people on these so-called happy farms where all the animals run around and they fulfill their physiological evolved needs and so on. And then at the end, you know, you, you off them and that's it. We eat them. Uh, so not, not, not going vegan or vegetarian. We'll still eat meat, but could they, could they at least be on an ethical happy farm? The numbers don't seem to add up for feeding seven and a half billion people. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and we know, so Temple Grandin, who's this woman who, who had autism, she actually thinks she's gotten over her autism and had a very deep emotional connection to farm animals, including cows and she could sort of tell when they were stressed emotionally. I think that we can all learn that. But basically, yeah. Yeah. that cows, they got stressed over things like, you know, um, like I'm getting into the swinging chain and shadows and loud yeah. noises. Yeah. And it, yeah. they, they, it's that, not on their cow. eye level with the railings. Yeah, I read her yep. book on that where, you know, yeah. you, you have to get down at their level and, and the walls are like this and there's something shiny right there. So you're standing, you know, two feet above that. You don't see it. So those kinds of changes. So, yeah, she's an interesting character. I've met her and, and, and I like her a lot. You know, her, her approach is not apocalyptic. Like, look, we're not going to end meat eating in the next century, right? The numbers are 
of vegans and vegetarians combined is like 4% or something, barely, if they're honest. <laughs> right. So, uh, so, so that's why I like her approach. I like your approach. What can we do to solve this specific problem right now? Yeah. And there is definitely a trade off. I mean, look, yeah, it's like, it's not when you look at the way the chickens are produced and the beaks are, are cut off and just jammed terrible. into those yeah. areas. It's, oh, it's, it's sort of terrible. terrible. You know, on the other hand, I kind of go, I look at these two examples, mountain gorillas in the Congo, yellow eyed penguins in New Zealand. Mm. There's many threats to those species, but the biggest one is often cattle ranching, you know, and so Mm. if you can reduce the amount of land for cattle ranching so that we have more room for yellow eyed penguins and, and cows, you know, look, if there were, you know, if there were billions of yellow eyed penguins, and only a few chickens, we would value the chickens. But there's only a handful of yellow eyed penguins left, only a handful of bound gorillas. And so we co- we think these are special species. We want to save them. But, yeah, I mean, I just go I don't think there's any way around the need to concentrate meat production. Um, it's not great. You know, I kind of am with you, like, don't eat too much of it. Um, but, you know, in the Congo, they need more factory farming you know, they need yeah. less ranch organic farming because all that wonderful, supposedly free range organic farming is threatening the habitat of gorillas. Right. Yeah. Well, these are hard problems. And, and often, you know, the, the progress happens incrementally and slow enough that you don't really see it on the evening news. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, apocalyptic hurricanes and fires do make the news and, you know, the availability heuristic that we, we fear the things we saw last in the media. Uh, and there's no one with a camera crew at a forest that just continues to grow nicely or a replanted forest or, you know, something like that. It's hard to see the kind of change you're proposing that can be, that can be kind of sexed up. Like this is a great moral cause. Get behind this. What do I do? Well, not much. <laughs> and then that doesn't feel like, you know, back to our moralistic instinct. Yeah. I want to do something. What can I do? So I'm going to like, I sort my garbage between the renewables and the trash, you know, the blue box and the brown box. And I put them out on the curb. I have no idea if this is helping at all, but I kind of feel like I'm doing something. I don't, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I actually take a fair amount of pride that I drive a 2002 Honda Accord. You know, at this mm. point in my life, I'm almost 50. My wife makes fun of me. My kids make fun of me. I can afford <laughs> a better car. I can. But like, why? Why am I getting a better car? Like, I don't. Um, and meanwhile, my neighbors who drive around with their noses in the air because they're driving these Teslas that cost a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> or these incredibly heavy machines. And I'm sorry. I'm like, no, I've made the environmental decision. You you're you're trying to have it both ways you know, yeah. bragging about how rich you are <laughs> and how moral you are. So so I do think that there are things, um, you know, look, if you eat chicken and fish, you have a smaller impact on the natural environment. If you eat farmed fish, you go to the grocery store and you say, I want farmed fish rather than wild fish. You have done something extremely important for the natural environment. Drive a used car, you know, um, you know, jet travel does produce a lot of carbon emissions. It's OK to reduce your jet travel. I don't think you have to, like, renounce it. Those are all fine things um, to, to take some pleasure in and, and take some pride in. So I, I, I think the underlying some of it is, I think, the, the visuals. But I mean, the story of meat production, that's great for TV. I mean, TV could mm-hmm. totally do it. And they could even talk about if they want they could even talk about how there is some trade offs. And but I mean. You know, the media could be doing these surprising counterintuitive stories. I'm actually we're in the process of actually we've got some interest in Apocalypse Never as a TV show. You know, oh, the good. 12 as an episode, I tried to write them in ways that were visual, but I don't see there. I don't see any. I don't want to give any excuses to these environment reporters who I think they're underlying. I think the bad coverage comes from an ideological place, not from a place of needing to tell a good story for TV, ultimately. Well, and, and, and clickbait, you gotta, you gotta have a headline that gets people to click on your link or else the advertising dollars dry up. So there's kind of a pragmatic problem built into the system, the way it's run now, the media, I mean, of that. there's some of that. I mean, for example, I point out, I've, I've got a big piece in the New York post today. I point out that the reason they keep claiming climate change is making disasters worse is so that whenever there's a natural disaster, they can talk about climate change. There's definitely some hmm. of that. But, you know, I did some pieces for Forbes. My piece on the Amazon was called Everything They Say About 
the Amazon is wrong, including that it's the lungs of the world. And I got, you know, two and a half million people write it. So, you know, it's not impossible to write. I try to write click. As people accuse me, they're like, you, that, they're like, the headline you wrote is clickbait. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. If people don't read your stuff, then then what are you doing? Yeah. You kind of have to do that. Well, I love the title of the book. That's why I like that. Apocalypse Never. Just a couple more points on the uh, the claim that uh, w- that uh, global warming causes uh, atmospheric systems to have more energy in them, and that causes more extreme weather, droughts, floods, fires, hurricanes, tornadoes. What's the story on that? Yeah. I mean, there is there is growing evidence that that climate change, like you said, more heat in the atmosphere, more higher temperatures is contributing to making some extreme weather events more severe. So we're seeing, you know, potentially higher wind speeds and hurricanes, definitely a longer fire season in California, um, more droughts, more heat waves. The issue I point out, though, is that that has not translated into worse disasters. So Hmm. the better infrastructure, better weather um, prediction. Um, and then other, and then the other side, more wood fuel build up in forests, like we mentioned, more houses near forests, those things entirely explain what makes disasters, you know, more severe in the times they're more severe. Um, and so then the question is, is there a scenario where this beautiful decline in deaths, 90% decline in deaths, 80% of the last 40 years, is there a scenario where those extreme weather events become so much more extreme that the disasters grow worse. I can't find anybody that tells me a story hmm. where that happens. Um, it would be terrible if it did. I mean, honestly, it's kind of like, but you know, you look at Bangladesh, which is the classic, environmentalists have always been predicting the worst mm-hmm. for Bangladesh over 50 years, it's terrible. It's always beat up on. They massively, I mean, it was something like over 90% reduction in deaths. It might be even 99%, I don't remember, can't remember. Just from better weather prediction and storm shelters, Right. Like nobody should die in the future from climate change. I mean, it sounds <laughs> right, radical, but it's like nobody should die. Like there should not be any more deaths from disease. There should not be any more deaths from disasters. Those trends have all been going in the right direction for 200 years. Food surpluses should keep going up. Now we could screw it up, but that's not. That's just because of what we do. That's not because of climate change, and so. You know, like I said, there's some more risks, but you kind of go if hurricanes become 10, 20, even 30 percent more intense, I don't think you should expect to see increases in deaths at all, much less 10 or 30, 10 or 20 or 30 percent. Our infrastructure is what keeps us safe. Yeah. 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 Well, Michael, we've been going almost an hour and a half. Tell us tell people about your uh, organization, Environmental Progress, and what people can do to feel like they're doing something. But that is fact based or science based. Oh, thanks, Michael. So, yeah, I've got a small nonprofit. We're totally independent. We don't take any money from any industry. So we're small <laughs> um, based in Berkeley on Telegraph Avenue. Uh, it's, we have a sweet little retail space. Um, we have two big things we work on, which is basically demanding that poor countries have access to cheap energy if they want, that no environmentalist or anybody else should tell them they can't have that. And also we defend and argue for nuclear power plants. So one of the funniest, coolest things is that in this book, two of the spokespeople for Extinction Rebellion, which is this radical oh, yeah. climate change group in England, one of them is named Zion Lights, which is like the hippiest name I ever <laughs> thought I heard. Um, she, at the beginning of the chapter, she just gets eviscerated on BBC by Andrew Neal, who's this former BBC broadcaster, just grills her for the crazy claims that Extinction Rebellion had made. But by the end of the book, because I interviewed her at the end of the book and we're talking by phone. She goes, Michael, look, I know who you are. Um, I just want you to know I'm pro nuclear power. Mm. And I was like, Oh, that's great. So, so she sort of redeemed at the end of the book. Um, a month and a half ago, a month ago, we, we figured out that Britain was very important because they are, they, Boris Johnson, the prime minister is considering building six full sized nuclear reactors, which they need. Mm. To, mm. For climate change, but also because they're an island and they import their energy and they need to have nuclear. I didn't know. I don't know anybody in Britain, really. I know Zion. I know another pro-nuclear guy, Mark <laughs> Linus. Um, Mark has a job. So I called up Zion and I was like, hey, would you help me? Long story short, we've become friends. And now she's the director of my 
She's oh, wow. director of British of British operations for for environmental progress. She came out as pro nuclear. Huge media coverage of it in the Daily Mail and the Telegraph and all over Britain. And now she's organizing um, pro nuclear events uh, in September in Britain. So. Hmm. The most important thing for nuclear, it's like the gay rights movement, basically, which is that it's just important to come out to your friends as pro nuclear because that's the it's personal. You know, it's it's, Mm -hmm. you know, for me, I needed other people to be pro nuclear to feel safe being pro. nuclear. Right. Right. So That's the main event. And so in terms of what people can do, we would love thousands of high school students to stand up for nuclear. That's the name of the event. Stand up for nuclear. Um uh, tweet, do social media. Um, these personal behaviors, these individual behaviors, are hugely important. I mean, the only obstacle, the only real obstacle to nuclear, it's not technical, it's not economic, it's just public fear and public acceptance. And if there's, if yeah. if, if people want nuclear, they're going to have nuclear. And the reason Britain is probably going to have more nuclear is that everybody in Britain knows they're an island, and that they and they and they're worried <laughs> right. about climate change. So. Britain, I, I, I'm really a big fan of Britain. I've, my, it's a new thing for me. And part of it is that it's a cradle of so much of civilization for us. But it's also so advanced, you know, that like I do think that they represent the future of human consciousness. And so for me, um, you know, hmm. British listeners and, you know, um, <laughs> uh, please help us in Britain. Um, but there's really anybody that can stand up for nuclear is is really serving the planet and humankind well, I think. Yeah, I think if you can have allies uh, in the environmental movement who support nuclear, that would be big. I remember seeing uh, Stuart Brand defending nuclear at uh, one of the TED conferences. And it's like, Stuart oh. Brand? Whoa, okay. I'm going to pay attention. <laughs> it's it's a little bit like uh, my favorite line. One of my favorite stories from Christopher Hitchens was uh, th- he got this from one of his editors. But it was when you hear the Pope say he believes in God, you think, well, Pope's doing his job again today. If you hear right. the Pope say, I'm getting to have some doubts about God's existence, you think, huh, the Pope might be onto something. <laughs> <laughs> so in a way, you know, to have people like you who are environmentalist activists and Stuart Brand and others say, no, nuclear is the way to go. That's probably the biggest thing you can do. And in addition to education, of course, we want to educate people on the facts, but it's never just the facts that drive social movements like that. That's right. Yep. Thanks Michael, for thank Michael. you so much. Congratulations on your yeah. book. Uh, I see it's it's doing well, and I see you on TV a lot, so that's good. I hope everybody gets the gets a chance to read it. Uh, I loved it. I, I listened to the audio version, which I usually do, and, and it was it was well done. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> All right. We'll talk to you soon. Thank Bye-bye. you.